Just 24 hours after she was born in this room, Maria Teresa Goretti was taken to the local parish priest of her village in Corinaldo, Italy, and baptized in this baptismal font. She was the third child of Luigi and Assunta Goretti and would become the youngest canonized saint in the Catholic Church. Luigi Goretti came from a traditional Catholic family, was intelligent and hardworking. Assunta Carlini was an orphan, made uncommonly strong from a childhood full of sorrow and deprivation. The two met while working side by side in the vineyards of Corinaldo, a medieval city 20 miles from the Adriatic coast. They were married here in the Church of St. Francis on February 25, 1886, where Maria Goretti was later baptized and confirmed. The newlyweds received only one wedding gift, this picture of the Madonna and child. It hangs over the bed in the room where Maria was born. The family lived in this little stone farmhouse as sharecroppers for the landowner, Rochi. Their peasant home was a simple one, no plumbing or electricity, only the necessities. Luigi farmed corn, wheat, and grapes on this small hillside plot behind the house. They were able to eke out a living, but it was with great difficulty. And uh, the great, uh, since they were raising wa uh, grapes for, for the wine, and wine was their principal product, uh, the income from that was uh, very low. If they made uh, what we would say is around five, six hundred dollars a year from the sale of the wine that they made, uh, that would have been a very profitable year. And they needed uh, at least three or four hundred dollars to live on. It was a harsh existence. Half of everything a sharecropper harvested or earned went to pay the property owner. Wealth was really uh, gauged by the amount of land that you owned. Um, the peasantry, if you didn't have, you didn't get. You know, if you, got, if you were poor, you got poorer. And they got caught in that. See, they were farmers, and they lived in Coronaldo, and they had a small farm, and they had no way to expand the farm. They didn't have the money to invest uh, didn't have the capital to invest in the kind of uh, machinery that might be required to get more um, to get more production out of their land. There was no mechanism for them really to acquire more land. Okay, maybe on a government loan. Robert Villard is a cousin of Maria Goretti, born in the United States. His grandmother was born in the same home as Maria in Corinaldo and knew her as a young child. Labor and poverty were the Goretti's daily lot but with trust in God, they began a family. Their first child died in infancy, but they soon had four small, healthy children, Maria and her three brothers. Little did these humble peasants realize that God was preparing a saint in their midst. She passed her infancy like all the other children. She received her education only at home from my husband and me the same education which we imparted equally to the other children so they would grow up to be good Christians. Up to the time we were at Corinaldo, she was always good, but I did not observe anything extraordinary in her behavior. It was a family where there was poverty indeed, material poverty when there was not an abundance of material goods. But there was plenty of unity, plenty of personal relationship, and of course, plenty of mutual support. Maria was a slender and graceful child with hazel eyes and chestnut hair. Goretti biographers believe that only two photographs exist of Maria Goretti. The girl in the center of this photo wearing the bandana is said to be the young saint. Maria is also seen in this photo with her mother and sisters, Teresa and Ercilia. As a young girl, she would often come here to the Sanctuario dell'Incancellara, or church within the gates, to pray. The small chapel was less than a half mile from her home. She visited the shrine frequently, especially in the month of May, to venerate the image of Mary, Queen of Peace. The Goretti shared the plight of most poor Italian families at the end of the 19th century. In those days, one in three Italian families emigrated. Maria's parents bartered sentimental ties to Corinaldo 
in hopes of building a better life in Pagliano, Italy, an agricultural area closer to Rome. At dawn on October 28, 1897, when Maria was seven years old, the Garettis waved farewell to their beloved hometown, Corinaldo, as they boarded the train at the seaside town of Ancona. Maria held the family's most treasured possession tucked beneath her arm, the picture of the Madonna. Pagliano was a step up for the Garettis, although not by much. Luigi was hired as a tenant farmer by a large landowner. Soon after their arrival, they were expecting their fifth child. It was around this time Luigi began a working relationship with another peasant family, Giovanni Serenelli and his 16-year-old son, Alessandro. The partnership would later prove to be a tragic decision. Giovanni Serenelli was an abusive, hard-drinking drifter who sharecropped from place to place. No photographs were ever taken of him. Before arriving in Pagliano, Giovanni and his 17-year-old son, Alessandro, lived and worked among the sailors on the shores of the Adriatic. Young Alessandro's upbringing left much to be desired. Tragically, as a young boy, his mother tried to drown him in a well, a misery that would scar him for life. According to his story, his mother uh, went mad, committed suicide. Uh, his brother <clears throat> died of a terrible fright. No one really knows what happened, but the real point of it is that in that family, there must have been a terrible secret and a real pain. The father was um, never there for the son. Uh, you know, the son was, a, you know, essentially left on his own for quite a number of years, uh, in the, according to what I read in the docks of Ancona with the uh, seamen. Uh, was exposed to the antithesis of what Maria Goretti was exposed to. Now you have these two forces coming together. Eventually, the landowner at Pagliano dismissed the Serenellis. Because of his working relationship with them, Luigi Goretti was forced to leave as well. Once again, the necessity of emigration was apparent. Because of his financial predicament, Luigi reluctantly continued working with the Serenellis and the two families moved on together. Through some friends, they heard of an opportunity in Le Ferriere, only an hour away on the estate of Count Mazzolani. The Goretti's new home was dismal. It was called the Pontine Marshes, or the Swamps. It was Italy's wasteland, consisting of uncultivated marshes, isolated cottages, herds of animals, bushes, and musty, foul-smelling air. In those days, there were no factories. There was just agriculture and farming. The terrain of the swamps, the soil, was very, very difficult to cultivate. It was difficult for farmers to cultivate and grow crops because of this condition of the terrain. The two families arrived in Le Ferriere on a cold February night in 1899. They climbed the steep staircase to their new dwelling, the upper floor of this abandoned cheese factory. It was being used for but cheese factory had folded. And uh, so there was an empty building. And uh, the Goretti family had talked uh, Domenico Camarelli and his sister uh, into accompanying him. And uh, so the two groups went down and worked very hard to drain the fields and they cleared about 40 acres and they planted that in wheat and it grew rich heavy grain in that drank soil and warm air and uh, well poor Luigi working 16 18 hours a day to make a success of this farm the Cimarellis who would later testify for Maria's canonization lived in the house next to the cheese factory they were witnesses to Maria's daily life and temperament. I used to see her every day as she passed by the door to get water from the well. But she never stopped. She was a serious girl. She went and came quickly and busily, and there was no reproach when we nicknamed her the little old lady. Teresa Cimarelli. In Le Ferriere, most of the population was composed of migrant peasants. In the summer, the mosquito infestation became so unhealthy, the local church had to close for several months. 
Holy Mass was celebrated seven miles away in Nettuno. Each year, malaria would unfailingly claim a portion of the workers. Count Mazzolani always kept a fresh supply of coffins on hand for his laborers. The Count and his family lived here on his elegant country estate. He was a sportsman, frequently duck hunting in the marshes or horseback riding on one of his prized steeds from his renowned stables. He treated the peasants fairly, but like any businessman, he and his countess would often visit the fields to inspect the progress of the work. A year after their arrival in Le Ferriere, it looked as if life was improving for the Garettis. But the long hours and back-breaking labor finally caught up with Luigi. After contracting malaria, he collapsed one day in the field. His body was quickly overcome by chills and fever. The fierce illness took only ten days to run its fatal course. On May 6, 1900, Count Mazzuleni ordered his chief of personnel to prepare a coffin. It was needed for Luigi Goretti. He was 41. When her father died, she stood before the dead body of her father. She was nine years old. She said, Mother, God will not abandon us. You, Mother, you go work in the field. I take over myself all the work of the house. She had faith even at the moment of sorrow. When facing sorrow, she doesn't run away from it. She faces it. She turns up her sleeves and gets to work. She puts herself at the service of her family. If at times I shouted at her, it was because worries over the farm work made me irritable. Maria accepted the shouting with calm and continued the housework without any sulkiness. She had a generous heart towards me and towards her brothers and sisters. In serving the meals, she ensured that they were satisfied before she served herself. Maria took every opportunity to visit her father's grave. She would frequently kneel here, outside the cemetery gates, and pray for him. Today, a plaque is the only memory of Luigi Garetti. It was placed here by an American soldier during World War II. He reported receiving a great grace after praying to the saint's father. Maria would wake every day at dawn in this room and pray as she dressed herself. She would then awaken the other children and help them wash and dress and then cook everyone breakfast. She had the ambition of schooling, and she dreamed of that and talked of it. She also felt uh, that it was inevitable that she would be a farmer's wife and uh, eventually have to know household tasks and duties, and so she learned to cook and to bake and so on with her mother, and she did that many times alone. Once a week, she baked fresh bread for the family in this bread oven outside the home. She would often wear her rosary around her wrist to make it easier to pray while working. In all respects, she dedicated herself to housework and the smaller children. Maria was always modest and reserved. We all liked her, and deep down we admired her. She was more religious than the rest of us. I was just a girl then, and would that I followed her example, but at that age, most of us are senseless. We scarcely know what we are doing. We seek pleasure and popularity. We permit ourselves to be distracted from better things. Teresa Cimarelli. I know that she used to do the housework with energy and diligence, and that she was most obedient to her mother. I have always marveled at her gravity in speaking and her grown-up manner. Filippo Vadi. By the time Maria was nine, she was going to the market in Nituno for her mother. After selling her eggs, vegetables, and doves, she would then do the family shopping at the market. It was on these trips to Nituno that she always visited the shrine of Our Lady of Grace and received her strength before the beautiful statue of the Madonna. This is the statue in front of which Maria prayed, and it's important because it's before this statue that she had the inspiration and she prayed and put into words what her expectations were. She did have a rich prayer life, even though the span of life was very short. 
only 11 years old. There are indications down deep she was in touch with God. She was united with God, and she was a prayerful soul, particularly the fact that Maria was in charge of getting together her brothers and sisters, the family, and praying together at night. At 10 years old, she was keenly aware of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Mama Assunta recalls Maria's constant begging to attend catechism lessons at a teacher's home in Campomorto. Maria would hike the considerable distance, rain or shine, to prepare herself for the sacrament. Although she was unable to read or write, she memorized all her prayers from the catechism, then taught them to the younger children. She had a great longing for Jesus in the Eucharist, and so she did all that she could to anticipate the date. And before receiving First Communion, she went and asked all the members of her family for their pardon, and she also asked pardon from Alessandro Serenelli. So the school of pardon started a long time before her death. Before walking to church, her brother Angelo was complaining about his shoes, that they seemed to be too narrow and they didn't fit him properly. And so Maria tells her brother, Jesus doesn't look at your shoes. He looks at your heart. This shows that she learned the catechism not only by word, but that she lived it out day by day. At the moment of her death, she is totally faithful to her spiritual journey. She was young, but she was clean. She was totally conscious of her own behavior. After the death of Luigi, as Maria prepared for her first Holy Communion, the Goretti's coexistence with the Serenelli's became increasingly strained particularly between Maria and Alessandro. The coarse-minded Alessandro made shameful advances toward Maria, which she always sternly rejected. He threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. He told her dirty jokes and dirty stories and made uh, obscene suggestions to her many times. And she'd blush, and the more she blushed, the better he liked it. And she would very often strike him or hit him with a broom or threw a bucket, one time she threw a bucket of water on him and stuff, you know, telling him to shut up. He was undisciplined and untutored uh, and uh, would stop at newsstands and pick up the forerunners of our girly uh, ma magazine pictures and so on. He decorated the walls of his bedroom with some of those pictures that were at the time considered immoral. At the death of my husband, neither Alessandro nor his father showed any interest, nor did they give us any consolation. The older Serenelli had an authoritative character. He was never content with what we did, nor was he of a praiseworthy morality, because when my husband died, he dared to make an infamous proposal to me. On Sunday, June 16, 1901, with a veil borrowed from another peasant family, Maria Goretti received her first Holy Communion from Padre Basilio Morganti in the Campimorto Church. It was the feast of Corpus Christi. Padre Morganti's message to the children before administering the sacrament was purity at all costs. Of the 12 girls and two boys making their first communion that day, Maria was the youngest, but clearly, the most spiritually prepared. Padre Morganti was astonished by the depth of her spirituality and her response to one of his questions. He, uh, like pastors or Italian pastors of this day, would sit down in a chair and each one of the students would come and thank him for the sacrament. And he would say, now, what did you ask Jesus when he was so close to you? And each boy would generally ask for a good commission in the army or uh, a chance to get some education or whatever they were interested in. Each of the girls was saying that they wanted to uh, have a nice husband or a healthy family and things like that or a good farm. And uh, when Marie came, he said, I suppose you asked the same as your classmates? And she said, not exactly. And he said, well, what did you ask for? And she said, to receive Jesus again. He said, si, 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 capito. But what did you personally ask for? 
And that's when she said, well, Father, this was the happiest moment of my life. I couldn't think of anything nicer at the time to receive again. And he said, if that's what you really asked, you may receive next Sunday, the following Sunday, and the Feast of the Precious Blood. And uh, she was just overjoyed. And that, to us, doesn't make sense. But remembering she was receiving. In those days, even nuns did not receive daily. In Our Lady of the Annunciation Church, where Maria received First Communion, is a painting behind the altar depicting the Annunciation. Ironically, the angel in the picture holds a bouquet of lilies in her hand, the flower later used to symbolize the life of Maria. Today, proof of the numerous miracles worked by the youngest saint in the church adorn the chapel walls. The sun was hot on Saturday, July 5, 1902, but a slight breeze blew through Le Ferriere as Alessandro, Mama Assunta, and the Cimarellis threshed fava beans in the field, about 130 yards from the house. The young Garetti children were also riding in the noisy threshing wagons with their mother. Maria was upstairs doing housework and mending a shirt for Alessandro. Maria's two-year-old sister, Teresa, was sleeping here at the top of the steps on a blanket. Alessandro's father, Giovanni, was on the ground floor under the steps taking a nap. About two o'clock that afternoon, Maria stepped onto the landing to sew while she sat with Teresa. In the field, Alessandro handed the oxen reins to Assunta and headed to the house. He climbed the 18 steps, walked past Maria, and entered the kitchen. The husky 19-year-old grabbed a nine-and-a-half-inch sharpened file and quickly pulled Maria into the kitchen. As he jerked the door shut, Maria saw the weapon and knew immediately she was faced with a terrible choice. Alessandro violently wrestled her to the floor. Maria screamed as she struggled to get free. Alessandro later affirmed her exact response. Maria said, No, no, God does not want this. If you do this, you will go to hell. What are you doing, Alessandro? You will go to hell. Her adamant rejection only enraged him more. In a blind fury, Alessandro began savagely stabbing her. I struck her blow after blow, he testified later, madly, as one crushes corn, as if I were striking wood. Any cry Maria made was drowned out by the steady hum of the threshing wagons. After he stabbed the girl, he went into his room and closed the door, lay down take a nap. And the wounds didn't tear, they merely punctured. First through the abdomen, he stabbed her 11 times across the abdomen, and uh, she fainted, and uh, he thought she was dead. Threw the knife in the closet, went back to his bedroom, closed the door, kicked off his shoes, and lay back for a nap. Well, she didn't hemorrhage very severely, just very slowly, because what he had used was an ice pick. It was really a file that he had honed down till it looked like one of our ice picks, and that's the easiest way to describe the murder weapon. Now, the wounds didn't tear. They merely punctured. And when she recovered consciousness, she called over the door, lifted up, and threw the latch back. He heard that latch snap, and he came out, saw her trying to get out, grabbed the pick and ran behind her and stabbed her in the back three times and those were the mortal wounds. They pierced the pericardium of the heart and also uh, collapsed her left lung. And when she went lifeless against the door, he was certain she was dead. He then went back to his room and locked the door. Well, it was her whimpering that awoke the baby Therese who was on the upper step. She had been originally sewing there. And as a result, the old man was napping down below outside in a hammock. And he came and said, Maria, get the girl. Shut up. Therese is crying. Maria, where are you? And uh, she didn't answer. As he came up, and he saw her in the doorway, tried to pick her up. He said, well, well what's the matter? You, you, you cut yourself? A santo, a santo. Venga, venga, gui, amenamente. And so there was all kinds of consternation as the mother came running in out of the field where she was 
pulling beans along with the other children. Mama Asunta asked Maria what had happened. Through her fading voice, she told her, It was Alessandro, Mama. He wanted to do an ugly sin, and I said no, and then he gave me many blows. Chief of Personnel for Count Mazzolini, Antimo Nicola Romagnola, arranged for an ambulance and kept guard outside Alessandro's door to prevent his escape before police arrived. It was six o'clock, four hours after the attack, when the horse-drawn ambulance finally arrived. Maria now had a long and bumpy seven-mile ride over the unpaved roads to the hospital in Netuno. Later, her doctor said they could not understand how Maria survived the stabbing. The trauma and blood loss from the attack should have killed her. She was brought here to the Orsinigo Men's Hospital, where she was treated in this separate, smaller building used to care for pregnant women located behind the main hospital. Dr. Francesco Bartoli tried to stabilize Maria. He discovered 14 separate stab wounds. Some of them pierced her clear through. The intestines were torn, lungs were sliced clean through, and the heart was grazed. I found her wounded in several parts of the abdomen and chest, and as confirmed by the autopsy, there was an injury also to her heart. During the treatment which I administered, the child invoked the Madonna and remained calm. I cannot remember now her precise words, but I confirm that she was at all times lucid and in full possession of her mental faculties. Dr. Francesco Bartoli. Before surgery, on the advice of the physicians, Maria received communion, had confession, and was given last rites by Padre Marino Giuliaro, the hospital chaplain. Surgery took two hours. No anesthetic was administered for fear of peritonitis. When she was lying on the operating table, she pleaded piteously for water. Please, just, just wet my lips. Just a drop. Please, please. And the priest, uh, knowing that the doctor shook his head no and the nurses wouldn't dare move because she had wounds, open wounds in the stomach, and if she had swallowed any wa water of any kind, it would have caused peritonitis, and that would have certainly taken her. So uh, the priest took uh, the crucifix and held it before her eyes and said, Jesus on the cross didn't have any water to drink. Can't you offer it up? And spontaneously she blurted out, All right, Father. During the night, two nuns remained at her bedside. Her condition worsened. And by early morning, the doctor noticed her failing respiration. The end was not far off. After a short interrogation by the police, Maria asked to be enrolled in the Association of the Daughters of Mary. This is the medal that the chaplain hung around her neck. It is in the room affirmed that Maria had at that moment a miraculous vision of the Madonna. The parish priest at Natuno, Temistocle Signore, entered the room next. It was he who posed explicitly the question of pardoning Alessandro to Maria. She replied, Yes, for the love of Jesus I pardon him, and I want him to be with me in heaven. I was told by the nun, or the sister, that nursed her and was watching at her bedside when she actually expired. Now, early in the morning, she roused up after a night of sedation. And when she roused up, she, the sister brought her a little statue of our Blessed Mother and put it at the bedside. And Marie just smiled and then closed her eyes. At three o'clock, out over the city, the bells were ringing the Vesper hour. In the nearby church, the Passionist priests were chanting the feast day antiphon from the 63rd chapter of Isaiah. Who is this that comes into heaven, this beautiful one in garments all red, with clothing stained like one who has tread the winepress? As the antiphon was being recited, Maria Goretti died. It was July 6, 1902, the Feast of the Precious Blood. 
the light-hearted holiday town of Netuno was rocked by the news of Maria's murder. Two days after her death, a massive crowd attended Maria's funeral, held here in the hospital chapel. This black and white checkered cloth is a piece of the dress in which she was buried. Newspapers throughout Italy reported the story on the front page. None of the Garettis ever entered the old cheese factory again. The grieving and penniless family stayed at their next door neighbors, the Cimarellis, in Le Ferriere, until the end of Alessandro's murder trial. The Pope, after hearing the news reports, arranged for the Franciscan missionaries to offer schooling for Maria's two younger sisters, at no charge. They were both received at religious institutions in Rome. Assunta and her three sons returned to Corinaldo, poorer than when they had left. Maria Goretti was viewed by people in general as a saint. The common opinion and attitude of the people who knew her and people who came to know about her following the incident was that she was very holy. She did not allow herself to be distracted by worldly desires. The story captured the attention of all the people in Italy and possibly even outside Italy. And some people began to visit the grave and pray to Maria Goretti as if she was already canonized. And from the very first day at the Nituno Cemetery, where she was laid to rest, needy souls came to ask her prayers and intercession. Almost immediately, miracles and healings began occurring at Maria's tomb. I saw a boy of Nituno brought to the cemetery by his mother. He was eaten away by consumption, a wasted child, Hermano by name. They prayed at Maria's grave, and the boy left the cemetery cured. From that day forward, he grew strong and healthy, and when he was 20, he was drafted for military service. Domenico Cimarelli. Alessandro Serenelli, neither at the moment of the crime nor at the present moment, shows any signs of neuropsychopathological derangement. He enjoys full knowledge and freedom of action. Therefore, we judge him fully responsible for the crime he has committed. Signed, Drs. Giovanni Mingazzini and Nicola de Pedis. Rome, October the 15th, 1902. Alessandro's insanity defense failed the day before what would have been Maria's 12th birthday. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison, the maximum allowed for a minor. His first three years would be spent in solitary confinement. At 19, he was not eligible for the death penalty. During the trial, he was incarcerated here at Regina Cele prison in Rome, but was later transferred to the penitentiary of Noto in Sicily. It was in Noto where Alessandro received his convict stripes and became number 3142. From the beginning, he was defiant and without remorse, maintaining that Maria was ultimately to blame for what happened. But once behind bars, Alessandro quickly felt the weight of his crime and his punishment. The tremendous desolation of solitary confinement was too much for many prisoners. Suicides were frequent, while others simply went mad. Alessandro himself was once quoted as saying, I thought it would kill me. He could step outside only one hour a day, but even then it was just a small court where he could look up and see the sky. That's all. I visited Alessandro's room with him, and I can tell you it was uninhabitable by human standards. Even after the first three years of solitary confinement, he could talk to nobody. He was taken upstairs, and there they could only speak with a half voice, and he was in a state of desperation. His desperation was about to change. One night in early November 1910, Alessandro Serenelli had an unexpected visitor to his cell. It was Maria. When I met Alessandro in 1965, I asked him about the dream. He said, 
The dream that I had gave me a powerful push to my betterment in the spirit. It was the only time that I saw Maria Goretti in a dream. I dreamt that Maria, all dressed in white, was gathering flowers in the garden, and the flowers were beautiful white lilies, and one by one she gave them to me. They just transformed into small lights. They were lit up like candles. Alessandro says Maria handed him exactly 14 glowing white lilies. One flower for each time he stabbed her. Then he wakes up and there is like a metamorphosis in him, like a change in him. He comes out of the crisis and he begins his moment of conversion with God and he finds himself. This dream was like the turning point between his former life and his later life. Before this dream, Alessandro kept continually repeating the same version of Maria's murder that he had given in court. Just those things told to him by his lawyers. Which was basically that he was framed that it was all Maria's fault. After this dream, he asked the guards if he could talk with the bishop from Noto. And in so talking to the bishop, he recognized the truth. And he admitted that Maria was very loyal to her creed and that she had been very religious and very good. And all the responsibility of what happened was his. From that moment starts his conversion. On March 11, 1929, Alessandro was released from prison. He had spent 27 years of his life behind bars. He was liberated three years early because of good conduct, a grace for which he credited Maria. By this time, there was considerable propaganda being circulated to make Maria Goretti a saint. Pope Pius X had already held Maria up as an example of true devotion and inspiration to youth. Padre Maro Liberate, a passionist priest, would soon become postulator for Maria's cause. In 1929, the young women of Le Ferriere and Nettuno, dressed in the colors of the Daughters of Mary, joined in the procession as Maria Goretti's body was transferred from the original grave in the Nettuno Cemetery to the seaside shrine of Our Lady of Grace. The week before Christmas, 1934, Alessandro, while working as a laborer on a farm in the region of Asimo, received a surprising letter. It was from a priest friend in Corinaldo, inviting him there for the Christmas holidays. The letter contained train fare as well. On Christmas Eve, Alessandro knocked on this door. It was the street entrance to Our Lady of Sorrows Rectory in Corinaldo. The white-haired housekeeper turned on the hall light and opened the door. Do you recognize me? Alessandro asked her. Yes, my son, came the reply. Do you forgive me? The white-haired housekeeper, Assunto Goretti, placed her hands on Alessandro's head. Alessandro, Maria forgave you. Christ has forgiven you. And why should I not also forgive? I forgive you, of course, my son. It had been 32 years since they had last seen each other. Mama Assunta led Alessandro through the town, past the marble statue of Maria, to number 34 on the Via Borgo Mazzini. Assunta Goretti lived in this house with her daughter, Ercilia. Ercilia was only four years old when she had last seen Alessandro as he was led out of Le Ferriere in chains between two mounted policemen. As they caught up on the last three decades, Alessandro learned the fate of the other players in this drama. Two of Maria's three brothers, Angelo, 14 at the time of Maria's death, and Sandrino, who was six, had gone to America. After being processed through Ellis Island, like so many other Italian emigrants, the brothers separated and went about their new life. Angelo was raising a family and lived on a farm in New Jersey. But tragically, Sandrino was killed in an accident in 1918. Maria's other brother, Mariano, seen here on the left, was nine at the time of the attack. He joined the military and later settled on a piece of land he was given in Naples. Teresa, the two-year-old baby who alerted everyone by her crying that fateful day, 
was now Sister Maria Alessandra of the Franciscan Missionaries. Christmas morning during Holy Mass, the people of Corinaldo witnessed that which could only happen among the poor of Christ. Assunto Goretti, together with Alessandro Serenelli, the man who murdered her daughter, approached the altar rail and received Holy Communion side by side. At the time, Alessandro and Assunta were together in Carinaldo. Little did they know of the extraordinary discussion taking place in the Vatican concerning Maria. The canonical process for the investigation of Maria Goretti's sanctity was initiated during January 1935. Father Morrow wanted to start immediately the process of canonization but the provincial superior said, look, in order to canonize someone, you need lots of money to pay all these lawyers to start the case, and we just don't have the money for that. So he said no. After Father Morrow was stopped by his superiors, he moved to Rome. But in the meantime, Father Morrow started printing millions of those little images of St. Maria Goretti and spread them all over Italy. And so a bit of interest started growing for her. And then in 1935, here in Netuno, a diocesan meeting of members of Catholic Action, they discussed Maria Goretti's spirituality, and the interest grew. After that big meeting here, the Cardinal Protector of Albano gave him the support, and Father Morrow started the process of canonization. So he called in the witnesses, Alessandro Serenelli, Maria's mother, and the other people, and in the course of 10 years, the whole thing was completed. A decade passed. Witnesses, including the family, testified about Maria's virtues before the postulator and Vatican officials, including the one they call the devil's advocate. Alessandro's testimony during all the proceedings proved to be most potent and precious in the eyes of the church. The slander against St. Maria Goretti, Alessandro openly and officially withdrew it at the process for canonization when, with his hand on the gospel, he swore openly that Maria Goretti had not agreed to sin in that moment when he actually stabbed her. But he also confessed that even two times before that day of July 5th, 1902, he had tried to violate her and she had always refused with total rejection. At age 54, tired of wandering, Alessandro was taken in by Capuchins here in Ascoli Piceno. He spent his days here praying for the redeeming grace of God that Maria secured for him on her deathbed. The monastery was secluded and apart from the world. He became a third order Capuchin tertiary. For the next 23 years, he would humbly serve in this hallway as the monastery porter and doorkeeper. Alessandro felt safe within the high walls and refuge of the monastery. He was able to work, read, pray, and attend daily mass with the friars. Among the countless miracles attributed through the intercession of Maria Goretti, only two were needed to complete her canonization process. Giuseppe Gupo of Rome, a stonecutter and poor day laborer with a wife and four children, had his right foot crushed by a falling boulder. The doctors had decided to amputate the injured foot. Unknown to them, his wife tucked a picture of Blessed Maria Goretti beneath the bandages on the injured leg. The following morning, May 8, 1947, there was no sign of injury, and his foot was normal enough for him to return to his heavy work. The second miracle was an instantaneous healing of a woman in Rome with pleurisy and water in her lungs. What occurred on June 24, 1950 has no parallel in the annals of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. More than a half million faithful gathered from all over the world to participate in the ultimate triumph of a little peasant girl's virtue. It was the first canonization that was ever held outside in St. Peter's Square. The Basilica could not contain the mass of humanity that descended on Rome that day. 
and never has there been present at a canonization ceremony the mother of the saint. Maria's four siblings, Mariano, Ercilia, Teresa, and Angelo, attended the canonization ceremony with Mama Assunta. Also in attendance was the president of Italy, Luigi Inaudi. Alessandro Serenelli did not attend the canonization or beatification. A young passionist priest from the United States was also in attendance. At the canonization, the Holy Father came down and uh, I remember how vividly it was. He stepped out on a platform and he said, I've been forced by the piety of the whole world to leave the Basilica of St. Peter's, which for the first time in its glorious history is hopelessly inadequate to contain this demonstration of faith. And here needs the blue vault of heaven and the first ceremony of its kind to raise to the altars a new patroness for youth and a model of purity in the world that has seemingly forgotten the meaning of purity and modesty. And then, as Pope Pius XII often did, he looked up from his prepared document and extemporized and said, What this little girl did, are you Christian people prepared to imitate? And out of almost every throat, spontaneously, We are! You know, the Holy Father was so shaken and tears welled up in his eyes. You could see him wiping his face and his, in the silence that followed, and we knew that he was moved to tears. It was now the supreme moment. The Pope, wearing the mitre, sat on the throne in his supreme authority of doctor and head of the church, and pronounced the sanctity of Maria Goretti. In honor of the holy and indivisible Trinity, for the exaltation of the Catholic faith and the increase of the Christian religion, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own, after mature deliberation, ever imploring the divine assistance, by the advice of venerable brethren, the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, the patriarchs, archbishops, and bishops present in the Eternal City, we decree and define as saint, and we inscribe in the catalog of saints the blessed Maria Peretti. Four years after Maria's canonization, surrounded by her family, Mama Assunta died on October 8, 1954, at Carinaldo. Alessandro Serenelli, who had become her adopted son through the most bizarre circumstances, was also at her bedside. A picture of Maria was on her nightstand. Only five years after Assunta's death, because of his own failing health, Alessandro came here to the Capuchins Monastery in Macerata for aged and infirmed religious. One day, he became very ill after falling down the monastery steps. As he lay dying, he kept next to him a picture of his victim. This is a copy of a note Alessandro scribbled out. It is a plea for mercy, but also a note of warning to the world. I ask pardon of the world of the outrage done to the martyr Maria Goretti and to purity. I exhort everyone to keep away from immoral shows, from dangers, from occasions that can lead to sin. Signed, Alessandro Serenelli. According to the Capuchin fathers, who gave the last rites and were with him those final hours, he said, I have suffered enormously for killing a saint, but now I have paid my debt, I have found hope and light, I have found redemption, and now I will again be with little Maria in heaven. Death came to Alessandro Serenelli in this room at Macerata on May 7, 1970, at the age of 88. He is buried in the same cemetery as the brothers and priests of the Capuchin order. To honor Corinaldo, 
The Goretti family gave permission for Maria's right arm to be enshrined beneath the altar of St. Maria Goretti Church. It was the arm with which Maria sought to defend herself from Alessandro's fury. Maria Goretti had a face to match the beauty of her character. This original portrait was painted by a nun from an exact description given by Assunta Goretti. Mama Assunta later said it was the most accurate and a true likeness of her saintly daughter. The original now hangs in the room at Orsenigo Hospital in Nechuno, where Maria died, now a chapel. Today, the old cheese factory in Le Ferriere is a Catholic preschool for children. The room upstairs where Maria was killed is also a chapel in her honor. The remains of Maria Goretti are encased in a wax image which rests in this crypt at Our Lady of Grace Shrine in Etuno. The chapel in the lower level is now dedicated to Maria. Since 1902, Maria Goretti has been exalted in art, literature, and music. Popes and world leaders have paid homage to her virtuous life. And her story has circled the globe, being translated into every language, including Arabic and Chinese. Truly, since the short life and valiant death of Maria Goretti, Netuno and the world have never been the same.